thank you for everyone who is on right now and participating and attending. Can everyone see Eric's screen? He's, you're sideways though, but I think that's intentional, right? Since the world is upside down at the moment, maybe that's okay. And it's nice to see you're wearing a mask. Well, I won't be for long because you can't hear shit. <laughs> so I'll be doing this, but. Um, okay. I am your father. Who's that yeah. speaking anyway? Is that Paul? Yes, that's me. That's me. Oh, hi. Hello. How are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm okay so far. It's getting a little fresh here because it's like it's like almost sunset. Good. How's the I'm weather? Really, I can't, if I wear this mask, I can't speak properly, so it's not going to be. It's a token. Great. And can everyone see him now properly? Who is everyone anyway? All the attendees. We have 366 people so far. Okay. Okay. And they can all speak to you at once? Um, no, they can't speak to us, but we're speaking to them. Good. And they're, see they're seeing you now on screen, full view. So take it away, Eric. Okay, we can go. Yeah. I wonder where everybody is. We're, we're in Berlin. It's uh, seven o'clock at night. Uh, 7 p.m. 1900 for hours for, for, for us. Uh, so normally I would be going home to have dinner. But as you all earlier, we're here in our backyard in Berlin. Potsdamer Straße, it's called. In the middle of the city. The weather's nice. And we're going to go into our workshop now. And I'm going to show you around. And I, and, I, and I shan't be wearing this mask because I wear the mask. I'll sound like Darth Vader and you won't hear a thing I'm saying. So, welcome to my workshop. Uh, sorry, it's closed. But you have an appointment, right? It says by appointment only. So, here we are. Um, so I have to speak to you or can I speak away? Is it still? You can speak away. You don't have to speak. I can speak away. Okay. Because I have to, because I have to introduce you to three masked young ladies. Um, the reason they're masked is, you know what, it's not because they're hiding their faces. To our left is Lilith, who actually is the shop manager here at the workshop. <laughs> then there's Helena, who runs our shop shop. We have a bookshop uh, uh, in the next door building. And there's Susanna, who started this thing with me and who happens to also be a brilliant designer and my wife, so she's stuck with it. Ah, and she has a face. So we have a, um, a fairly large collection of type here, as you can imagine. I, I wonder, do I have to explain what letterpress is? I will explain a few things as we, as we walk through the shop. I just like to take you around uh, some of the, the more visual place. We have, a, um, I think about 500 cases of wood type. And we have some stuff that didn't fit into the cases, so we put them along here. Um, some weird stuff, some very large stuff. I mean, it's, just, it's not very practical, and they are not complete alphabets. So you only use them to make concrete poetry. So maybe Norman can just uh, zoom around here. These are all, um, we call it assorted, meaning messy. Uh, some of them have been uh, sorted out, some of them have been. Some of these are from America, from the USA. Some of these are from Germany. For example, this one down here, if you can still see it, Fraktur, it's obviously a German typeface. And um, lots more here. And we also have bicycles. So this is, I don't know why this, this stuff is out here because there wasn't room for it anywhere else. Most of our type, however, is in drawers, and some of it is even a catalog. I'll show you the catalog. Well, and here's our posters we print, by the way. Um, this workshop doesn't exist to print these posters, but um, it's the only way we can make a bit of money on the side. We print 50 of each of those posters. I sign them and number them, and then they're very precious, especially when I'm dead. So you better hold on to them if you ever buy them. So we have, um, we tried a while back, whenever a new intern comes in, they are required to print whatever we have, a complete alphabet or complete showing. Sometimes we put on the back where they actually are in, in our drawers, but we keep forgetting and we keep moving stuff around. So it's, it's a pretty messy shop. 
this uh, happens to be one of my favorite von Fahre. More about this later, because we have a lot of it in all sizes. So this is uh, there's German type, Italian type, American type. I don't think there's any English type, and there's type we make ourselves. But uh, more about that in a minute. So apart from the warehouse, where unfortunately we have more food presses. My uh, ambition has always been to die with the, to be the man with the most uh, proofing presses when he dies. Um, six of them are, five of them are here, sorry. Uh, we had six at one time. There's a few more in the, in the warehouse. So these are all German Corexes. There's a, a Swiss uh, FAG at the end. Some of these are motorized, which means the, the carriage moves if you press a button. Um, the ink well is also motorized. There's a gun in the back, I'll show you in a minute. Um, but what I'd like to first uh, maybe emphasize, I, don't, I can't tell who of you has any experience in this at all. But one thing about letterpress is that um, it all looks the same from here, but it's all about the spacing. It's the stuff in between that's important. If you look here, I don't know if Norman can zoom in here. Between the, all these letters here, they are, there is space. There's no kerning. There is kerning, but then you're gonna have a hexo and you destroy the letters. There's tracking. So we tracked with these little pieces of metal. That, for example, would be a six point. No, actually, that's an eight point. That's a six point. Um, and as you can also see, you can't read this. We, we typesetters read upside down so we can see from left to right. So it's mirrored but, and upside down. And um, what you also see, I don't know why these are, are red here. You make mistakes frequently. Um, you know, God is in the detail. Deep, um, you don't see this until you print, and even then, you don't see it until you come back two days later and realize, oh shit, um, there's a spelling mistake in there. Uh, we didn't see this, and not everybody wants the one that's wrong. Nobody wants the proper one because it's boring. Which uh, brings me to the next thing we've been printing. Or today, we've printed. Can I just jump over here? Sorry. We printed this. Susanna printed this today. A quote that we thought was John Lennon, but apparently it's uh, Oscar Wilde or Shakespeare or Confucius. Nobody quite knows. This is the red form. Of course, the one thing in letterpress, every form has to be printed separately. This, our coliform, was pre-printed. And this is underprinted today. This is, of course, as everybody here knows, accidents grotesque. This is uh, 12 Cicero or 12 line or 12 pica, 144 points, in other words. And at some point tomorrow or whatever, we're going to print the black form in here, the credit line, which will come in there. Um, and here it is in metal already set up. Thank you, Norman. And some of you may know that if you want to keep a piece of type, we tie it up in red string. So you can keep it and move it around and tomorrow we will drop it in the machine. Um, Lilith and Helena are Happen to printing postcards by sheer coincidence. We are at the moment in our day glow orange red face. We've been buying a lot of day glow ink. We just love it. Uh, it makes everything look cheerful. This is another accidents test. This time it's the, um, the bold one in 48 point, right? Upside down, of course. <laughs> and it's German, which means everything will be good or fine at one time, which is our motto, obviously. Uh, this is the Berlin dialect version, but you will know that. Now, um, one thing, as I said earlier, what happens if you, if you look at type, um, you don't really see any, you just see stuff. So we printed, we wanted to print this, and then we realized we made a type for it. Um, you know, but when they thought we, we might as well keep it. So we, we're printing it with a typo. I know it's... Uh, Political. That's also day glow. Uh, I don't know how many will print, but you see, you look at this, you just see letters. You don't see, you don't see words. You don't read, read words. Now, another thing you have to know about letterpress, as I said earlier, it's all about the spacing. This is the stuff you don't see. This is white space, because if you touch it, and it gets your fingers dirty because it's metal, heavy metal as it were. So we have another sort of a few weird collections. For example, we have a, a type that is printed in two, could be printed in two colors, the positive and the negative. So that would be the H printed in two colors. I think that's from Italy. Um, 
a quick overview of the materials we have. A traditionally type is cut in oak or in, this is maple. This is uh, one that I designed, FF Real, that was cut by a friend in Romania. This is cut by the Hamilton guys in Wisconsin out of, uh, I think it's also maple. We tried Formica, which prints really well, but uh, is not very stable. This is MDF, also cut by the Hamilton guys. This is 1927, it's probably oak or German stuff. This is old American, probably also oak. This is German again, and this is a, a composite from, from the 1930s uh, by Berthold called Placadua. So it's resin, it's, a, it's a, an artificial resin, which prints really well, uh, is a little brittle, and it's very precious. I won't let anybody handle this except myself and our uh, direct people here. If we have workshops here, I'm sorry, you won't be able to touch it. Um, what's interesting, so there's also, people have been casting characters this is from Spain. So this was done in a mold and then cast in plastic. It prints pretty well. This is a similar uh, cast. This is from Italy. It's also plastic. So cast from a mold, so is this. This is a lovely, um, yeah, this can only be American, the Wild West type. It's about as elongated as you can get. Uh, I don't know what wood it is, probably also oak. And people have sort of weird laminates that are put on, on top of wood. We did some 3D printing which, I mean, it doesn't weigh anything, it's nice, it prints if you sand it down a little bit, but this would cost about $10, um, so it's totally outrageous. This is um, plastic, I have no idea who made this. Um, and this is, this is large type, this is 10 point, it goes way smaller. Um, you think this is small, you can see my, my thumb there, it's 10 point, actually, Accidentsco test normal, so you can imagine what it's like to uh, set type that's even smaller. So there you are again. Um, this is all the spacing. This is a quad, 36 point quad. So it's 10 point thick, 36 point wide. Here you have little spaces, one points, two points, six points, whatever. Here's a quad, an M quad. And that was 10 point by 10 point, et cetera. Here's a, an N space, half a quad. In other words, so that'll be five by 10 point. You get it, right? So you set this in a little composing stick and then you put it in the press eventually. Ah, Susanna is printing the mistake. Hold it up, Sue. It goes in the drying. So what I'd like to show you here is something I said um, it's very, seems to be very modern. Uh, this is the typeface called Reporter, and it, it's, it's sort of trying to imitate a handwriting, which of course in wood type is pretty difficult. So what they do is a lot of ligatures. This is German. So we have a ligature here, ENT, which is a frequent German combination. S-C-H, A-U, E-N, E-I, double F, S-T. So this typeface has about 25 ligatures, not only to make the handwriting look better, but also to speed it up. Because if you set one of these, it's quicker than setting uh, three separate letters. So lig ligatures are not only more aesthetic, they also save a lot of work. And we have some, <clears throat> we have this type in a, in a lot of sizes. Uh, there are certain faces that I, I, I collect, the porter being one of them. This is uh, from 1938. Um, we have uh, a lot of accidents to test because we're in Berlin. Berlin is the home of Berthold and they made that here. So it's a very much a Berlin type face. Then I also uh, design typefaces, as some of you may know. And one of them is called Real, which is my version of accidents to test. So uh, like a real idiot, I had this cut in wood. This is in, in, uh, in maple, in Ahorn, as we call it. The good thing is that if I cut it myself or have it cut, I can have as many letters as I want because normally you never have enough type. You're always running out of E's or N's or uh, what do we have? We didn't have an apostrophe, so we had to make new apostrophes. Here I can do a lot more, but it's costly. So don't try this at home. It's a very expensive and stupid hobby. I also cut a typeface for the heaven. Oh, by the way, no, this is you're going to see. This is very precious. These are coins. I didn't even know what coins are. 
I'll show you in the machine. This is how you lock out a foam. And these are rare and very expensive. For some reason, I have a lot of them, but they're not for sale. And I'm very proud um, to have a collection of coins. I also have a nice collection of uh, composing sticks, which are all brass. Um, most of these are German. There may be an American one in here somewhere. Oh, this is an American one. Different. So you set about one or two lines of type in there at a time, and then you put it over into a galley. This is a galley. So you set your type in there. This is tied up with a string. This is just an alphabet. What we have a lot of is shit, stuff that we don't know where it belongs to. So it goes somewhere until somebody wants to put it away or not, as it were. Um, the, oh, the typeface I did for Hamilton, is it is there, is there enough light here? Yeah. Okay. They, they cut them with a pantograph and, and, and a router. And uh, if you have sharp corners, the router can't get in there, so they have to work with a chisel afterwards. So I designed this for Hamilton to have no sharp corners, so the router can go very, very quickly and very evenly. So in other words, it's a preconceived um, problem that they may have. I, I avoided the problem by designing it for that particular method. Everything is heavy here, everything is dirty. Or if Daniel was here, no, I'd get the Heidelberg going. Should I get the Heidelberg going? Um, should I get the Heidelberg going? The beast. I'm not running it anymore. It's too, it's too noisy. It's dangerous. I don't think if I, I think if anybody came in there from some sort of safety uh, uh, outfit, they would probably make us take this away because if, with people close to it, you have to have a fence around it. The reason, one reason I wear my hair so short is I can't get a port in here because it's painful. That goes for all the other places also. So let's uh, walk around some more. So as you see, it's type, 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 type. Um, this is the department where we get to the smaller metal type and another one with the buttons. Ah, Norman. Norman is getting carried away there as a cameraman. Just as well, Norman. I've got to tell a couple of stories here because, as some of you may know, um, oh, Jesus. <laughs> oh, these things are really heavy. Uh, this is a 60 point accidents for test. Now, there is but one foundry left in, in Europe. There are a couple in America, and foundry meaning the people that make metal type. And I'm not talking about monotype or iron type, but real foundry type where there's one, one metal character, one matrix, and it gets, um, the, um, the type gets cast into metal. I did this for a project for a friend of mine. And um, when we, we, we tend to borrow the matrices from a museum in Leipzig, and the, 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 the foundry guy is near Frankfurt. And they called me and said, well, I don't have a couple of, I don't have a capital M, I don't have a lowercase g, what can we do? So we found somebody near here who could cut us a, a matrix into, into a, a brass with a, with a, a CNC machine, so like $20 per matrix. So you can do one a mat, we, I think we made about 10, but if you did the whole type, we'd have to bought 120 mats for one size. So that is out of question. But as we were doing this, I also then designed this one, which didn't exist, of course, in the typeface, nor did they have arrows, uh, nor did they have euro signs and that stuff. So why, and, and a hashtag, for example, th those didn't exist in the day. So because I had to supply a couple of drawings for some of the missing characters, I also did that. Um, now, one thing I, I, I know uh, some of you may have heard this, this is our most uh, um, popular poster better done than perfect, which actually I don't believe in. I'd much rather have it perfect being, being the German here. And we've done a few versions. We've done one where that E is missing on, and not that E, and we've done it in color and stuff. And everybody thinks it's ever so clever. But what happens is this is the, re the result of bad preparation. 
So I started setting this, I think it was a really great saying, and I'm setting away, setting away, and I suddenly realized, shit, I need five E's. I only have four E's in this case, as you can see here. So Ferdinand, uh, my assistant at the time, we looked at, or I said, we'd put another E from another font, or maybe print it, print it twice, and said, nah, it's too late in the day, we can't be bothered, let's just do this. So the lesson here in, in letterpress is, uh, when you have type like this, you do what you do. If there's only four E's, you make do with four E's. You don't print two or three colors because every color is extra work. So we print one color only. Um, normally, these days, it's day glow red. It used to be just black. And um, you make do with it. And that is, is uh, people find rather refreshing these days that you don't have a 16.7 million colors. And you don't have, uh, how many how many fonts do I have on my, I think I have about 16,000 typefaces on my, on, my, uh, in my, on my computer. So it's all a little tedious. Um, so I would like to show you how these presses work. This is the biggie. Oh, this book. This is going to be a poster, maybe. That's the word fake. Uh, the German word fact, the opposite of fake, is spelled with a K. So if you overprint this, you have the word fake and the word fact. That's maybe for tomorrow. Um, this is a very large letter. Now this press is my my favorite one. It's pen or metal, meaning I put a sheet of paper in here. There's not well. I take this out just to be on the safe side. This is only for proofs, mind. You can print a hundred, but then you get very fire. So um, you put your paper in here. It's not tight in the bottom. Um, these are the ink rollers. They would have ink on. This is the oscillator that distributes the ink. I'm going to switch it off so you can see the rest. So I press the, this, the, the, the uh, papers in there. I press the button where it goes. Here you can see the ink would be on this drum. The ink would also be in here and be distributed. There's a roller missing, which, we've been, which is being recovered right now. So with this ink web here, you can print like 100 posters with fairly even ink. And then you press the button again, so the machine goes back, and this gets delivered automatically. It has a pump. It sounds a bit like, uh, what's the hairy guy in Star Wars? It has that sort of two bar, two bar, I don't know what's it called? Yeah. It sounds like somebody that takes a heavy breath. So it, it delivers the paper back and you can print another one. You can probably print on a good day, you can probably print about 50, 60, one color in an hour. Um, some of the others are a little less automatic. Like this one, it's all manual. It's called a platen press. Some of them come with a treadle or an electric motor, but this is all manual. It's kind of like slave labor. Here you have a whole cabinet of what we call furniture. So this is a, these are the spaces. So that's uh, 12 by 28. That's 12 pikers wide, 28 long. Not all, are, not all have them on there. The modern ones do have that on there. So this is the most important stuff. Um, and if you're working well and you build a form, you try to work with big pieces. Not only are they, uh, um, it's quicker, but it's also more stable. And when you print the second form, like you put a second color in there, you have to measure and remember where the stuff was before. So here we here is now on the on the manual printing mistake. And this press has one added extra, which can be dangerous. You as type has of different heights, like American type is, uh, as some of you may know, 0.918 inches which is 23.33 millimeters. European type is 0.928 inches, which means 23.56 millimeters. This machine will adjust to different heights, which is also dangerous. Sometimes you have it on a, on a, on a um, low type and you put a higher type in there and you run it and you break the type. So you have to re always be very careful. I've turned it down a little bit to give this type a little bit more pressure. Um, so turn down means that the, 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 the better the press actually comes up. So degree. And this is inked at the moment. Um, there is an ink roller also in the back, 
but every now and again you're going to put some fresh ink on <laughs> which is our favorite day glow red mm -hmm. this needs a lot of ink too. yeah that stuff eats it up also because it hasn't been printed before it's mm, and that's and when you put in ink on you learn to listen to it it has to have a certain sound uh, if there's no sound, there's not enough ink, if the sound is too noisy. I think that's a good sound. It has to have that little smacking of the lips, as you were, when the, the rubber hits the eye, the seal. Then you know you have enough ink. If it doesn't make that noise, you've got to add some more ink. And when, when that noise goes away, you know you've got to ruin it. I don't think there's any, any rules. You just, when you do it, you hear it. And you realize other readings, we also see it obviously here. This is also the, the type I just remember. And it's actually physical work, as Susanna will tell you. Okay, now, um, seeing that we have all these manual stuff and all these people are here for you, because normally that we'd be home, I'd like to show you. We put all digitally. Oh, the espresso machine, of course, it's very important. Everybody has to have an espresso machine if you work. There is no way you can survive a whole day here without making really good coffee. We have our own uh, brand of coffee, of course, which, of course, is called Letter Presso. I mean, what else would it be called? you know, letter, presso, um, which my brother roasts. So that's a very important item here. We also have sweets for strengthening. And we got a collection of bottles, and way more. Obviously on the shop, can I say that? 98, nine, nine, eight, no, p988.com is our website on the shop. There's another shop. Um, over in uh, a little far up, further away from here, I want you the picture. That's the onion or printer who was supposed to be here tonight. That's the Heidelberg cylinder. Next to it is a very, very large printing press called the Johannesberg, which prints 32 pages of a brochure at once, or a newspaper, which is probably stupid, of course, four pages of a newspaper. This is letter press. But it's letter press, meaning that it's printed from a red surface. But nobody could afford to set this stuff in linotype or monotype or let it on by hand. So instead, we use the, the, uh, the good of the digital and the good of the analog, meaning we set type on the Macintosh with InDesign. We can manipulate a type, we can do whatever we like. This is probably the own there, I think. And then we, we built ourselves a laser setter, a machine that takes these nylon plates, polymer plates, uh, throws laser light on them and where the light hits it the emulsion hardens and the rest gets washed away so you have a relief plate if you could touch this you would know that it's it's raised by about uh six tenths of a millimeter so it's a it's a proper relief and then we put those into this Heidelberg press uh, on a magnetic bed and then we print and then we print letter press so it's a, it's a letter press machine that prints these sheets we can print eight pages uh, and we are printing books. We printed uh, these books. We're in the middle of doing a whole series in two colors even. So this is letterpress, which means it gets the impression. It gets the, the nice blackness. It gets the feel. I mean, there is a relief here. And we can print half tones, no problem. We would print four colors, that would be stupid. But we also get the advantage of, of a decent type. We never run out of ease. We never run out of characters. We can manipulate type. We can set half sizes and quarter sizes. All the stuff we couldn't do in uh, old-fashioned letterpress, which is a romantic idea, but a very unpractical one. So this shop really only does sort of play. Um, we do print short runs. We could theoretically print books here. We are supposed to do a, a monograph about Louis Oppenheim, one of my design heroes. So designed Fanfaro, for example, that typepress over there. Too fast and get shit done. And um, We've collected that typeface into pretty much every size from 12 point up to 40 line, which is very large. Um, that's the, the next job coming up. <clears throat> that poster at the back there, 
normally you know, that's printed on, on the big Johannesburg and the big press. And those numbers there are millimeters. Uh, so that's what 50, 50 by 40 millimeters. Okay, now we do one big swoop around and I think now we've got our 30 minutes. And apparently I'm supposed to answer, take questions. Paul, is there anything else uh, I should say you want to know? Um, well, there's a few questions from the audience. And well, I'm going to sit down for that, if, you, if I may. Sure, of course. You can... I'm getting old in this late. <laughs> That's no, great. Yeah. Take your time. We have a few more minutes here. Have a coffee or chocolate. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't. I can't uh, serve you coffee. That would be ideal. Is it I need to hear you, know? the rebound is sure enough. Not in front of the TV. Oh no. <laughs> Norman has got this amazingly newfangled sort of robot thing that swivels around with a little engine. It's incredible high tech. All so, right. uh, Paul, are you ready? I'm as ready as I ever will be. Okay. Well, some specific things about the type that you showed. So, um, which foundry cast the metal typeface for the arrows? Would you do you remember that? That was Berthold, yes. Okay. Well, originally, uh, the in back in but the the, the recent stuff, the, the one foundry left in Europe is called Rainer Gerstenberg or Gerstenberg, as you would probably pronounce him. He's in Darmstadt near, uh, near Frankfurt. He's in his mid seventies, so he isn't going to be around forever. And then there won't be one foundry left in Europe. There are a couple in America that do foundry type in the USA, I should say, but nobody here, which is really sad. And, and casting type on, on one of those casters is something that you and I won't learn overnight. It's really complicated. It needs a lot of experience, so it's died out. Okay. Uh, and what about resin type or polymer plates do you do you like working with those yeah it's a like i said it's, it's the advantage i mean we can i can design a book like i would design any book or, or a newspaper or a brochure uh, it's probably too expensive for a brochure and making those plates then like i said gives us the advantage that the really nice ink the bite you get into the paper and uh, and the feel and smell of letterpress but you know, I can change the layout overnight. I can, you know, if, if I'm two pages over, I go down by a tenth of a point and I can save those two pages. I couldn't do that on a line and type or a monotype. Somebody would have to sit down and, and retype a complete book, which we have a line type and there are people who can use it, but nobody's going to pay for those hours and hours of recasting type. Whereas if I get a manuscript from, a, from an author, it'll be a Word document, you know, which is not my favorite format, but put it into InDesign, and then I can manipulate to anything. Uh, for example, I'll have to pick a slightly lighter typeface than I would for offset because it'll get a little bite and a little spread in, in printing. Um, I might um, open up the tracking a little more because again, it gets a little ink gain. So you have to design slightly differently for letterpress as you would do for offset printing. And as a follow-up to that, uh, we have a question from John Barry saying, have you designed a typeface? John have you designed a typeface specifically for polymer plate? No, I haven't, but what? It's a polymer plate example. Yeah, oh. yeah thank you. Uh, no, but uh, if, I, if I would, I probably would do what people already do in size specific. If I can use size specific, if I'm, we, we're printing books offset also, and there I would always go for the small um, so as for example, the, the new Balbaum or Wallbaum, as you would probably say from monotype, that Charles Nix designed, one of our ta favorite typefaces ever. He has a very small size, but officially I think it's for six point. That works well in offset. If I go letter press, I've got to go up for the next size, which I think is a 12 point, because it'll get that little weight that gained through, uh, through printing. Uh, so I don't have to design for that. Now that we have variable type and we have size specific cuts, they serve me well. I would go always for the one a little lighter for letterpress. This, for example, Susanna just points me out. This is uh, a polymer plate here, this, this thing. That's real wood type. So they, they combine really well. This is cut into um, uh, plexiglass, actually. We, we, we have a laser upstairs, so we can cut those things ourselves. Mm -hmm.
And that type is uh, Paul Renner's plug from 1928. So that's wood type. Uh, as you can see, there's a little bit of dirt in there. So we combine them if we have to, because uh, otherwise I couldn't have that negative. You can't have a negative. Uh, you can't say negative type like this, obviously. And printing white on red would be idiotic. <laughs> All right, um, and then you mentioned um, you get some wood type from the U.S. Um, are there specific places that you go to, like Hamilton or? Well, if I went to again, uh, my wife would probably divorce me because I promised not to buy any more type. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. What I would do this, I mean, I, I bought some when I started out. I had my first press actually in San Francisco, which I ended up giving to the San Francisco Center for the Book when we moved away out of that studio. So I bought a lot of stuff around. I know I, I remember getting stuff, stuff from Maryland and, and from the West Coast because people are, you know, trading in it. But these days I would probably rather have my own stuff made. And I am thinking of um, going back to Hamilton's who have uh, not only the old guys who've always been doing it, but they're training young people now to use the pantograph. They also use a CNC machine. I think some of the stuff they did for me, the larger size, were done on a CNC router anyway. So I send them data. So... I get wood type, um, so I get the benefit of having large wood type, but I also get it made for my data to, to my specifics, and I, I know exactly what I want. I can get my ligatures, I can get my sizes, I can get my, my frequencies. Um, for example, if we, we have German type, there's never enough Ys in there. The Y is a very rare letter in German. If I might only have one Y. So whenever we set English text, we always have to have a few more Ys made. Uh, why? Because there is a, sorry. <laughs> because Y doesn't really exist in the German language very much, uh, whereas every other English word seems to have a Y in it. So having it made at Hamilton's is, is um, I'm talking to Bill over there. Uh, I need to design the lowercase for this art style face that I did for them a few years back. So they will obviously cut that and then they get to keep the digital version and they sell it and they keep the proceeds. That's the deal we have there. Great. Um, so there's a lot of questions about your letterpress studio. Is it open to everyone? Obviously, you have to make an appointment. Well, normally, I mean, people right now, obviously, it's, it's a difficult time, but people tend to walk in, which is both nice, nice and not nice. Uh, some days here where I don't do anything because I sit down and somebody walks in. Uh, we're here from Portugal, Japan, wherever, and we heard about you, and are you there? And of course, I'm there. So they come in, we have a drink, we talk. They leave presents. It's great. I love it, but it does. It is not very productive, but it's making a network of like-minded people. So people do come by. We do also have um, classes come by schools. Uh, a lot of them from from the USA. A lot of them from Australia even. And then we 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 show them around, and then they get to print a poster. We set up a poster, maybe like one of those that I shown you, and everybody gets to crank the old handle and uh, oohs and ahs. Oh my God! Because it is quite. If you've never done this before. It's quite an experience to have a white piece of paper and this messy stuff in the press and you, you crank it through and you end up with a clean print. People like that. But the main thing is we, we, uh, the only way I make any money here is by having workshops, which of course have canceled for the last six or eight weeks. So people come in, individuals between six and 12 people, often from a digital background, who actually want to touch type for once and see you know, what a grid really is and how you build a grid. And um, they come between, what, nine, nine to six o'clock, and they love it. And we charge money for it, and we have two or three instructors, and they all get to set something, and they get to print it. They get to clean up afterwards, and uh, they all love it. And some of them have come back. A lot of people have done their, their sort of Christmas party here. Instead of a Christmas party, they come here for printing, or their annual excursion, or management sort of um, meetings. Uh, we've had a board of a, of a publisher uh, here, Instead of doing one of their, their off-sites, they had their off-site here. And so they had the infighting doing over who gets to print what. Um, so that's, that's the other thing we do. But mostly I was supposed to do my experimental projects here. One of them is the inventing the polymer plates with our own laser setter. The other one is making our own type. We are thinking about uh, um, uh, CNC cutting into what I call aluminum. You call it aluminum, which I hate. Um, that's <laughs> ongoing. It, that might be a possibility. Uh, it, it's not as, as expensive as you think, and uh, aluminium is a really great material. And doing publications like this one about Louis Oppenheim, who is a very unknown type designer to most people outside of Berlin, outside of Germany. 
and as now we've collected pretty much all these types as in the real uh, as real metal and wooden type Ferdinand and I will write the uh, um, uh, his uh, a monograph about him and print every single size uh, in, a, in a short run that's been the, the uh, aim for what seven years now this year we might get into it so um, I read in your book um, hello I'm Eric um, that you ran a, a poster shop called O&P in the 70s is that yeah. correct so correct. so is, is P98 sort of a uh, Harkening back to that of some sorts, like having a shop and a metal press, or you know, that never occurred to me that that uh, that poster shop was back in the uh, late '60s when posters suddenly became a a thing that people actually bought posters. You know, before you bought posters that you stole somewhere, but then people actually made posters, like movie posters and stuff. And that was something I did as a student on the side to earn money. It never occurred to me that it had had a connection. Uh, the P may be the connection. Now this is, I also had a letterpress shop in the 60s and 70s that burned down. So this is going back to my, my roots as you were, as a typesetter and a letterpress printer. But what interests us now, now mostly is how the digital and the analog come together. That we're all fed up with the digital to an extent. I mean, it's not gonna go away and we make a living out of it, but it's kind of nice to go back and, and do stuff with your hands, get your fingers dirty, um, get your hair caught in the press and, and make shit. I think it's a, it's a growing trend. You know, some people it's pottery or knitting or carpentry. For us, it's letterpress printing. And so, for every digital designer who's come here, uh, has taken taken to it and likes it a lot. So that's basically the aim of this shop is to go into the post digital, not denying the digital, not being anti digital. We're not luddites. You know, it's not that we want to throw the machines away, but we also want to to have a, a choice and and do something uh, manual. We all have our our um, MacBooks with us, so it's not that we are. We're not digital, but we do want to do the analog at the same time. And um, what kind of inks do you use? Are there like soy inks or like, are they mostly chemically? Well, I don't know. I haven't tried eating one of them. They, uh, I'm not sure they're edible. They are rubber based actually these, so they're not like totally poisonous, but I'm sure they're not, uh, uh, they're not very nourishing, especially the Dayglow ones. I don't want to know what's in there. We do clean them up with, with uh, cleaner food, petrol, essentially, so that's not very healthy. Um, I'm afraid, uh, but I don't know what else one can do there. There's, um, I'm sure there are soy-based inks all over the place, but we do have one supplier for black for the for the big Heidelberg press. Of course, the normal inks that we get are too; they don't work for that. They they are as we call them, they're too long. We need short inks, inks that have very lo a, a little tack and dry quickly, so don't smudge. And those inks you can't buy anymore, so we have them specially made by by the can. But other than that here, there are normal inks that you could all probably also use for offset. Um, so there's a lot of questions about how does one get started trying to do letterpress? Is it, is it best to, uh, you know, join a workshop, uh, mentor with somebody, read a book? Yeah, there's plenty. These days, there's, there wasn't any literature about when I started, but now there's quite a lot of books about. There's also letterpress shops in pretty much every city I know. And most of them have a little bit of type on the side, but most of them do work with polymer. In fact, polymer making plastic plates was the savior. If that hadn't happened 20 years ago, letterpress would be way dead. And the only place where it thrives is the sort of hipster places in what Minneapolis, San Francisco, New York, Boston, where young people have uh, got themselves a Heidelberg platen like we have here, um, and they make polymer plates because type is expensive, it's unpractical, it's always the wrong size, it breaks, it doesn't wear well. Um, so polymer made letterpress survive. And if you get letterpress now, especially in the States, it's that very deep impression that I would have got kicked for by my boss when we were doing this in the 60s, because it would destroy the type. But with polymer, you can give it that bite, it doesn't matter. You know, mostly it's sort of um, wedding invitations. But somebody wants to start, I would say just look up your letterpress printer. I'm sure there's one. I know there's people in LA. Every decent city in, in, in the USA has a letterpress shop. And they tend to be, well, they're all nice people and they usually like showing you around because they love what they're doing. So they like to share it. There are books, of course. The only problem in the USA is, not so much in Europe, is the presses are hellishly expensive. You can get one of those little uh, tabletop ones for a, you know, maybe a couple hundred or even given away because they're bitches to carry. A proofing press like we have here, you're looking at 10, 15, 20K. 
Come to Europe, you can buy them for three and a half or five. Uh, when we started here seven years ago, there were 500 and 1,000. Now in America, I bought the one seven, eight years ago for $10,000 and it was a piece of crap uh, that I had to totally take apart. So that's the expensive thing. Um, so join with other people or, or go and use a press. Go, for example, in San Francisco for the Center for the Book. They have similar places in, in, in other cities where you can join, you can learn, you can take a course by somebody who's done it before. You can rent space there, you can rent hours there, you can just come in and use the presses. You can use my press, the one in San Francisco. That is probably the way I go to. I don't know what other cities do, but I know there, there are these sort of uh, um, book places, uh, printing places in, in other cities, certainly in the USA, certainly in London, uh, certainly also in Germany. Uh, are you doing okay? You have time for more questions? What, do I look as though I'm falling over any second now? No, <laughs> Just checking. I don't have to go to bed yet. I'm not that old, you know. <laughs> Just checking. Try to be polite. <laughs> don't want to be an ungracious host here. Um, don't worry. No. Okay. I said yes to this point. Don't worry. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so what, do you still do any corporate work or um, any consulting? Yes. You do? Okay. So we have an early question. Um, so when you do identity manuals nowadays, um, what do you define as the output for your identity manual? Is it like a, a book, a PDF, a web page? Does it matter? No, there's no manuals anymore. I wish there were because there were, you know, we got paid well for doing them. But even in the days, in the 70s and 80s, they disappeared onto some top shelf by some, uh, some uh, executive uh, who paid for it. But it hardly ever got into the hands of the designers. And if they got in the hands of the designers, they were usually very, very busy ignoring them because who needs somebody else's rules? So these days it's a little easier, but it's also more difficult. It's very easy to make rules. You just, you don't have to, you PDF data, whatever. It's somewhere and people can download it or not. Uh, so it's easy to distribute the, the guidelines as it were, but they tend to be, they have to be more flexible than they used to be. You can't give a company one typeface and one color and say, use this, it's terribly boring. So. The flexible rules and guidelines basically means that you have to bring people in who understand what the brand is. It might be different in two years' time. Uh, things change. The, the mood changes. The industry changes. So it's become much more of a, how I would say, education business. You've got to bring everybody who, who runs, now it's called branding, not even corporate design anymore, who runs it at, 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 the, at the brand, at the company or whatever. Uh, you have got to bring them in and understand and formulate, you know, what is this about and how do we best achieve it? Do we hire some good designers to look after it for us? What assets do we need? They obviously need typefaces, they need, a, you know, some colors, but it's, it's, uh, it's very, very fluent. I don't think anybody's printed anything out for decades. I remember we did a typeface for Cisco, maybe seven, eight years ago. They had a couple of brochures, that, but I don't think anybody ever printed them. There were PDF downloads. I printed one out, but um, I wish there was more print but it tends to be distributed as, as guidelines and um, they're online, they're sometimes interactive. Um, these days you can have intelligent systems that, you know, the system knows if you're printing a, a eight and a half, 11 page, that the type can't be smaller than whatever, eight points. And, but if you go to a, an iPhone service, it has to be at least 14 pixels. The systems will have that intelligence built in, which means us designers have to think a little harder and anticipate all the needs. So it's got, it's, got, it's got way more difficult than it used to be, but also more rewarding in a way. Right. Uh, and then what about, um, how can 3D printing help with sort of like reviving, you know, obviously equipment and um, actual letter forms? You see- Yeah, we have, we have high hopes, but we, we've been trying. We have a friend uh, who keeps going, doing this stuff. And uh, he's sorted the issue of, he, he can get the shape done. He's got a little sort of hollow honeycomb thing, so it doesn't weigh very much, doesn't use so much uh, metal, uh, doesn't use so much uh, uh, material. But the, the resin that's used at the moment doesn't give you a smooth surface. You've got to sand it down, which means you're not sure what the measurements are afterwards. Is manual work involved? And at the moment, at least, the bags of whatever that powder is uh, seem to be the price of coke. I, I don't know what coke costs, but it's kind of like, it's very expensive. Uh, and a character sort of like a six line character, like a character, would cost about three euros or three dollars. That's outrageous. I can get it in wood for half the money. So for now, it's something that we're watching, but it's not compatible, uh, or competitive at the moment. It will be eventually, but hasn't yet. Eventually, of course, it should be metal 
or, or something a little more precise than, than this cheap sort of uh, plastic, whatever they use there. Uh, so the technology is there, the material isn't yet. It's what desktop publishing was maybe 30 years ago. We'll be watching it. Okay. Um, do you sell any, obviously you sell your, your prints on P98A. Are you, are you currently able to ship anywhere? Oh yeah, oh yeah, shipping is the one thing that works. I mean, the, the guys, uh, um, the DHLs and, and UPSs and FedExs are here every day. Uh, I mean, if it wasn't for shipping, we all die. I mean, because, you know, how do you get food in these days? And how, how does the supply chain work? Now that works pretty well. Uh, it hasn't slowed down. Uh, the guys come in and, and chuck stuff at you. They don't come in anymore. And we have an office across the street that takes our packages. Now, that's, that's, that's been our, our saving, actually. If it hadn't been for that, uh, be be in the very dire straits here. And when will the truck thump poster be available? Is that all? I'm not even sure. We, I printed, why, how many did you print, sir? I think I only just printed 10. I think I may, may have printed 20 or 30. It's still in the press. We may print more. I don't know yet. It was a, uh, uh, we did this a while back and, and people, I mean, people and we gave it away. So we, we I'm not sure. People, people paid shipping. Oh yeah, we gave it away at a time uh, uh, for shipping. I don't know. We haven't made up our mind yet. We may, there may well be a demand for it. I just did it to show that big type. And, um, <laughs> uh, and the day glow, cause it's, you know, you need large amounts of type and it's, it was fun printing it. It was just simply, it came about. So it's not a commercial product, but who knows? Okay. As, as Mr. Trump, uh, Mr. Trump, or whatever it's called, would say. Who knows? We'll see. Um, so when the weather gets warmer, it may get cheaper. So there's uh, questions still about your type design abilities. Um, do, you, do you have a favorite letter that you like to design? Do you have a favorite typeface that you worked on? <laughs> Everybody is laughing because everyone knows it's the lowercase a. Not only is it difficult, it's also the cuddliest and the cutest and the most important. Um, you know when you design in type, you have, you, have a, you have to have a straight and a round and a diagonal. So I design an A, an N, an E, and an S. E and, and N are the most frequent letters in most languages. A is also frequent, S is also frequent, they're also difficult. S has those two curves, A has, you know, the, the belly and, and the thing going through the middle. E is... When you have an E, you have an O. It's the same shape. It's also difficult because you have the divider in the middle. N is boring, but N is the basis of, of M and, and U and H and all the rest of them. So you design an A and N and E and an S and then a capital H and a capital O and you basically have the character. That's kind of like the, the DNA of a typeface. And the rest is just boring repetition. The V is a bitch, the Ys are bitches and Ws are bitches because of the diagonals. So I tend to do a Y. And, um, and then the characters are there and the rest is then just boring work. And so you have a, a catalog of the, the different uh, letters or typefaces you have in your shop. Um, would, which, uh, of sorts, yeah, it's not complete. Yeah, but which typeface would you like to have or wish you had? Well, as I said earlier, there's a few things that I, I'd like more of. We don't have very many serif typefaces because serif fonts weren't built in large sizes uh, for posters, obviously, because they take too much space, they're too delicate. So I'd like a few more serif faces, like some, maybe some slab serifs. I don't think we have, we, have more, we have that Sunday Wide West American ones. I'd like a few more slab faces, really big chunky slab faces uh, and of course you know we we, we are good friends with the Tipoteca guys in, in, uh, in Veneto in Italy and they have all, a lot of stuff from the 20s and 30s the futurist stuff the, the weirdest stuff I mean it is so decorative and all over and, and over the top we love that stuff I would like some of those whenever we go there we did this project for Adobe last year where we redesigned some of the uh, the 1920s typefaces that stuff is incredible it's uh, each letter is a piece of art like we, you know, we have some of them. Uh, they are impossible to get, and if you can get them, you know, they're like twenty bucks a character. So they're beyond us. But we love those a lot. They're unpractical. Um, and as you can see, uh, this is a very German shop. There's a lot of accidents because it's where I come from. And block. This is what I bought, was brought up on. But if we had our choice, we get Italian twenties and thirties stuff, Art Deco, futurist, amazing stuff. I, I think that's all the time we have. Um, Good. 
thank you for obviously showing us P98A, uh, showing us Remember. what you've done recently. <laughs> yes, and stay safe. Um, thank you again. We look forward to seeing you here in New York or us coming down to Berlin one of these days. Hopefully soon we can travel again, yes? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for doing this, Paul. See you later. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye studio. Bye. <laughs> Thank you for um, coming today. Uh, and don't forget, we have our uh, com upcoming talks on Tuesday, next week, and Thursday. And see you soon. I'm going to end the meeting. Thank you.